That concludes testimony from Ambassador Bolton. In just a few moments, several experts on the viability of U.N. sanctions after the Oil for Food program. The remainder of this hearing runs just over an hour and a half. Mr. Joseph A. Christoph, Director, International Affairs and Trade Team, U.S. Government Accountability Office. Uh, Mr. Karn Ross, Director, Independent Diplomat. Dr. George A. Lopez, Senior Fellow and Professor of Political Science, the Joan B. Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies, University of Notre Dame. Gentlemen, uh, thank you uh, for being here. As is our custom, I need to swear you in. So if I could have you stand, please. Raising your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Note for the record, our witnesses have responded in the affirmative. Um, you all uh, were uh, at our first hearings, uh, first panel of this hearing, and so you, you have a sense of some of the questions, uh, though some members aren't here right now. Uh, particularly as they relate to the issue of sanctions and so on. Um, I'm going to uh, invite each of you to make your statement. Um, we'll have uh, whatever time we need to make sure we cover each of the territories. And if I don't ask you a question that needs to be asked, uh, but you had heard this question earlier and you want to answer it, you can ask yourselves uh, and then answer it. Um, I want to make sure that we have on the record uh, information about uh, the significance of sanctions, if they're going to work, uh, how they work, when they fail, if we can do that, um, how you back up sanctions uh, so that they um, do what we want to do. Um, I'm very, I'll say this, I'm very fearful that uh, if sanctions don't work, we leave our government options that are not very tasteful. So with that, Mr. Kristof, um, we'll have you start. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thanks for inviting uh, GAO to this important hearing. Uh, today, uh, I would like to discuss uh, specifically a report that we issued last week on lessons learned from the Oil for Food program and how some of these lessons learned bear not only on future sanctions but on UN reform efforts. Uh, my comments are based on three reports GAO issued last week, both on the Oil for Food program and UN reform issues. Uh, let me summarize three lessons from the Oil for Food program that highlight how a, a positive control environment can improve future sanctions. First, the sanctioned country should not be allowed undue control over the terms of a sanctions program. In the Oil for Food program, the UN ceded control over key aspects of the program to the former regime. For example, the UN gave Iraq, rather than an independent agent, the authority to negotiate contracts with companies that purchased oil or supplied commodities. The second lesson learned, take into consideration the economic impact that sanctions have on neighboring countries. UN member states, including those bordering Iraq, were responsible for enforcing the sanctions. However, Iraq's neighbors circumvented the sanctions because they were economically dependent on Iraq for trade. Trade agreements, for example, enabled Jordan to purchase heavily discounted oil from Iraq in exchange for up to $300 million in Jordanian goods. Iraq also smuggled oil through Turkey and Syria, and as a result, Iraq obtained $5 to $8 billion in illegal oil revenues. The third lesson learned is that all aspects of sanctions must be enforced with equal vigor. The UN was successful in keeping military items out of Iraq. However, the UN did not adequately examine contracts for inflated prices, which enabled Iraq to obtain between one and a half and three and a half billion dollars in kickbacks. 
The Oil for Food program also provides lessons for addressing UN reform issues. The first lesson is that agencies responsible for UN programs must have clear lines of authority. The UN managed the Oil for Food program with multiple entities having unclear lines of authority. For example, the Secretariat's Office of Iraq program was not responsible for rejecting contracts based on pricing concerns. In addition, UN inspectors did not have the authority to inspect goods imported into Iraq to verify their price and quality. The second lesson learned is that risk must be assessed as programs expand in scope and complexity. In 1996, the Oil for Food program began as a six-month effort to deliver emergency food and medicine to Iraq. However, it expanded into a six-year, $31 billion effort to build houses, construct irrigation systems, purchase oil equipment, and fund sports and religious facilities. The UN did not assess how this expansion placed the Oil for Food program at greater risk for waste, fraud, and abuse. And finally, monitoring and oversight must be conducted continuously. For the $67 billion Oil for Food program, the Office of Internal Oversight Services dedicated only two to six auditors. This contrasts with the 160 auditors that the Volcker Commission said this audit agency should have deployed. In addition, the independence of the internal auditors was compromised. The Office of Iraq Program denied the internal auditors funds to audit the Oil for Food Program in central and southern Iraq, where most of the money was being spent. So in conclusion, the Oil for Food Program does offer several lessons for designing future sanctions and strengthening existing UN programs. Of utmost importance is the need to establish and apply a sound internal control framework, whereby roles are clearly articulated, risks are mitigated, and oversight is continuous. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my statement. Happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Ross, um, I think that I didn't provide enough information when I said you're an imp uh, independent diplomat. Can you just give us a little bit of your background before you speak? I don't usually ask witnesses to do that, but it would be helpful for the record. I'm delighted to, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I can sense from that accent something already. Can you move <laughs> the mic a little closer to you, sir? Is that thank close you. enough? That's what. Thank you. Um, my testimony, my sum, the summary of my testimony actually uh, it retails my history on this subject, but what I'm doing now is I run a non-profit diplomatic consultancy um, which advises various governments and political groups on diplomacy. So uh, we'll hear a little about it in the testimony. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I was a member of the British Foreign Office from 1989 until my resignation in 2004. From late 1997 to June 2002, I was the diplomat in charge of Iraq policy, including weapons inspections and sanctions, at the British mission to the UN in New York. There, I was intimately involved in policy making and negotiations on Iraq and other Middle East policy at the UN Security Council. I also played a close part in discussions between the British and US governments over, over these years on all aspects of policy towards Iraq. I resigned from the British Foreign Service in 2004 after giving testimony in secret to the official inquiry in the United Kingdom into the use of intelligence on Iraq's weapons of mass destruction, the so-called Butler Review. There are several key lessons from my experience of sanctions on Iraq and the Oil for Food program. My written testimony goes into much greater detail. First, any sanctions regime must be carefully targeted on those individuals whose behavior you, you are trying to affect. Sanctions on Iraq were crude and harmed the wrong people, namely the civilian population. Sanctions did prevent Iraq from rearming with weapons of mass destruction or conventional weapons, as both my and the US governments believed in all the years I worked on the issue. But thanks to sanctions busting, the Iraqi regime was largely impervious to the effects of sanctions, and Iraq failed fully to comply with its, its obligations to co cooperate with the weapons inspectors until threatened by invasion in 2003. 
There are many options available other than comprehensive sanctions, including financial sanctions, travel bans, arms embargoes, etc. Such smart or targeted sanctions should always be preferred to comprehensive economic sanctions. Second, while, while it is easy to blame the United Nations for the failings of the All for Food program, and these were many, the UN member states too failed in their responsibility to enforce and police sanctions on Iraq. I need here to correct a, uh, correct a misunderstanding that seems to be widespread here. While it was the UN's responsibility to supervise the All for Food program, it was not, repeat not, the UN's job to police sanctions. That responsibility belonged to the member states. This would also apply to f future sanctions regimes that the Security Council might agree. Evidence such as that collected by the US government's Iraq survey group shows that the Saddam regime largely subsisted on illegal oil exports to Jordan, Turkey, Syria, and elsewhere, but prim primarily the first of these two. Revenue from this source amounted to some $12 billion, far exceeding the approximately $1.7 billion it gained from abuse of the oil for food program. Other members of the UN Security Council often blocked collective action against sanctions bu busting, but the US and British governments turned a blind eye to smuggling by their allies Turkey and Jordan, thus in effect helping the Saddam regime to survive. Officials in both the US and British governments frequently internally recommended comprehensive action on sanctions busting, but for various reasons it was never attempted. If we had acted on this illegal smuggling, we could have severely undermined the Saddam regime without the need for military intervention. Third, sanctions policy is complicated and difficult. It requires a major effort to engineer, amend, and supervise sanctions. Volker's inquiry into the offer food program took 18 months and employed over 100 skilled investigators. But at the time, both the US and UK governments employed no more than a handful of officials to monitor the program and sanctions, and they were often poorly equipped for the complex te technical issues, such as border monitoring or dual-use technologies, which arose. Those officials were overwhelmed by the size and complexity of the program. Senior officials and ministers paid the policy far too little attention, even though it dealt with a primary security concern. Moreover, we should have paid more intrusive attention to what the UN was doing in the program. This failure was partly a function of our lack of capacity, but the effort, however substantial, to supervise and make effective any sanctions policy will always be considerably less than that of going to war. We should, moreover, be conscious of the sometimes perverse effect of sanctions. By casting him as a resistor to US and Western pressure, sanctions in some, way, in some ways reinforce Saddam Hussein's hold on power. The All for Food program gave his regime control over food rations and other essential supplies to his people, strengthening his already repressive grip. In some ways, therefore, sanctions strengthened Saddam to the extent that some came to believe that we, the UK and US, had an, had an interest in keeping him in power. More generally, the effectiveness of any sanctions regime is in part a function of their legitimacy. By the late 1990s, comprehensive sanctions were seen by many in the international community as disproportionate and cruel in their effects, when Iraq had largely, though not fully, complied with its WMD obligations. This undermined support for sanctions and made our job in enforcing sanctions very much more difficult. Sanctions should be proportionate and well-targeted if they are to enjoy the broad international support for them to be effective. In this context, no sanctions regime is seen in isolation. US and British failure to enforce Security Council decisions elsewhere in the Middle East, particularly in Israel and Palestine, undermined our efforts, undermined our demands for their enforcement in Iraq, as it does to this day in other cases. We will be more effective in any particular case if we are seen as consistent in all cases. But my mo most important po point is the last. Sanctions and the manipulations of the Saddam regime caused considerable human suffering in Iraq. The All for Food program, despite its many problems, helped ameliorate this suffering, but it was not implemented until the 1996, when already considerable damage had been done. Sanctions helped destroy Iraq's economy and infrastructure, damage for which Iraq and the US taxpayer is still playing, paying today. Any sanctions regime should be carefully designed to minimize human suffering. The lesson from comprehensive sanctions on Iraq is clear. We should not make this mistake again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ross. I appreciate your statement. Mr. Christoph, I jumped so quickly into Mr. Ross. I, I meant to say as well, we appreciate the good work and uh, appreciated your statement as well. Uh, Dr. Lopez. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I've had the privilege over the last 13 years 
of serving as an independent scholar and a member of a research team that has tried to systematically investigate United Nations sanctions, and it's that knowledge and experience I'd like to bring to this hearing today. Well, it's very welcomed, and it is uh, extensive, and we appreciate your presence. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can the Congress and the American people have confidence that UN imposed sanctions in 2006 and beyond be a useful and powerful diplomatic tool? I believe we can. My colleagues have addressed the questions of uh, the Volcker Report and the, and the lessons learned from there. I'm not going to repeat that nor repeat what's in my larger written testimony. But I want to uh, have us uh, look at two questions. One, the first is understanding that one of the outcomes of the Volcker Report is, particularly in report number one, a clear delineation of responsibilities in what is called the United Nations system regarding sanctions implementation which belong to the Secretariat versus those which belong to the Council, versus those which belong to member states. I believe a dispassionate reading of the Volcker Report underscores a fundamental reality of United Nations sanctions, that they are only as effective as the willingness and ability and fairness, as Karin Ross has said, of their application by member states and a willingness to enforce them. In the Iraqi case, and we had instances of misinterpreting this even in our first hour, the Security Council's determination was first to hold together a regional coalition of states bent on denying Saddam Hussein's ability to acquire military goods, and then to maintain a flow of humanitarian relief to the Iraqi people. That the entire sanctions process from oil for food on was politicized to achieve this end, or that deals were struck in 1996 when oil for food was already on the table to provide relief in 1994, is to engage in a kind of revisionist history which fails to look at a critique of UN agencies which may be misplaced, which ought to be more directly placed on the burden of the member states to strike deals, to undermine what the Secretariat brought to them, and to question the Council's own action by their own behavior. Having said that, I think the Volcker Report and current proposals before us for UN reform offer a rich ground by which we can have added confidence that ethical behavior at the individual level, secretariat behavior, and particularly member state behavior may be, may be seen as more competent in the administration of future sanctions regimes. But since Karin Ross ended his own presentation with talking about greater and smarter targeted sanctions, let me draw to the committee's attention the fact that while all of this controversy for oil for food and the terrible reality of the Iraqi episode and its uniqueness was unfolding in the 90s, so too was a secondary process behind the scenes, beginning in particular uh, with, with the uh, initiatives of various governments from 1998 on, there's been under the radar screen a development of a great deal of expertise. I believe that one can claim that the strongest reason for congressional confidence in economic sanctions as effective diplomatic tools it emerges from a past decade of meetings of diplomats, sanction specialists, experts in banking, commodities trade, law enforcement, transportation, and representatives of international organizations who have worked together in concert to define, develop, and revise substantial proposals in what's called smart or targeted sanctions, beginning with a very important initiative by the Swiss in 1998 in the interlocking process, continuing with German input in arms control issues, and finally, a Swedish initiative to improve targeted uh, economic sanctions as well as aviation and travel bans. We have great confidence and now expertise within the UN system that emerged in the kind of resolution we saw last week. That is, the ability of the Security Council to target individuals, not nations. What we see out of Security Council Resolution 1373 and the work of the Counterterrorism Committee the ability of the United Nations system to now target real offenders and free itself from the burden of the economic hardships that were cast in the Iraqi case. The ability to get to real offenders with smart targeted measures is at a higher ability than ever before. The imperative of smart sanctions, I think, is self-evidence. That is, the nature of the diverse offensive that we experience now calls on the Security Council and its members to apply new and important techniques. We did this against UNITA armed faction in Angola, against RUF rebels, against the Khmer Rouge. We're doing against terrorist groups and entities which support terrorist groups. Our means of imposing, implementing, monitoring, and refining sanctions are more robust now, Mr. Chairman, than ever before. The Volcker Committee's accounting system recommendations will contribute to this, but the strength of this lies independent of that. 
It lies in independent reform processes that have developed over the last six or seven years, strongly backed by not only non-governmental organizations, but research units in Europe and the United States. The importance of the oil for food scandal is that we need credibility and ethical behavior at every level. But we also need tremendous competence and what might be called appropriate fashioning of sanctions at the policy level. The ongoing task of United Nations reform as it bears on sanctions is that now we have the technical means we have not had previously, and certainly didn't have at our disposal in 1996, to move sanctions, whether they be in Sudan, Iran, or elsewhere, against real offenders and improve the prospects that sanctions may contribute to global peace and security. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to um, the dialogue we're going to have. I think we've got a great mix here and uh, some real pros. Uh, and I think the issues are absolutely huge, absolutely huge. I mean, uh, we're talking about how we succeed without going to war, it seems to me. Uh, with that, Mr. Lynch, I'm going to invite you, uh, and I'm going to do uh, 10 minute rounds of questions with three members. That way we can kind of get into a little better. And then I, I'm going to go to you, Mr. Van Hollen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I want to thank the panel for helping the committee with its work. Uh, in looking at the Iraq oil for food program example, uh, there seem to be <coughs> two levels of, of failure. One, it appears that we, we set up a program that empowered Saddam Hussein and gave him a very important part in the whole process. Uh, I, I know that we began to, to negotiate around an oil for food program back in 91. Finally, after a number of failed attempts, we came up with this this program, but unfortunately it did give considerable leverage to, to Saddam Hussein. And so that, that was one weakness, uh, probably a fatal weakness in the process. But then there was also the implementation aspect of this. In other words, after the program was set up, we still had an opportunity at the Security Council to reject, to question, to delay contracts. And yet, uh, I think the numbers are out of 30,000 contracts, I, I believe maybe two or three were, were ultimately rejected, and they were probably not for financial reasons, but probably because of uh, um, prohibited trade items. What, what, I'm, what I'm asking you is how much of those, those two areas, how, how much, let's just begin with the first one, uh, the fact that we empowered uh, Saddam to, to, to be a player here, and we allowed him to negotiate oil prices and contracts and, and all that. How much of that doomed uh, this thing to failure? And, and are there recommendations from the panel in terms of the next time we, we have to do something like this or, or you know, something, something very closely similar to it, not necessarily the exact same thing? Sorry, Mr. Christoph. Christoph? I, I would begin, but that was probably the, the greatest weakness and failure from the very beginning of the program, allowing a sanctioned regime to set the terms and conditions of the program that ensued. And um, I think that clearly is one of the lessons learned, that in the future, uh, if a regime is sanctioned, that says something. They should not be given the green light to dictate the terms of how they were going to go about and ultimately negotiating contracts that included kickbacks and, uh, and at getting commissions uh, in return as well. So that, we, you know, in, in auditing terms, we talk about the control environment and you have to set the right tone at the top. And in effect, you didn't set the tone at the top if you allowed the sanctioned regime to set that tone. Right, right. Um, Mr. Ross? I, I, I think these are very big and complicated questions. I mean, one of the pro problems with Iraq sanctions policy in the Oil for Food program was that policy was ad hoc over a very long period. It was never, never did officials sit down and design the perfect sanctions program and the ameliorative program, which was the Oil for Food program. They came sort of one after the other. Sanctions lasted much longer than any, anybody expected. Um, I think, to be honest, it's very easy to say that we should not have put the power in the hands of the Saddam regime to distribu distribute f food and other goods under the Oil for Food program. I'm not sure, to be honest, that there was an alternative. Uh, you couldn't have got UN agencies in there to do the food distribution. The, the Saddam government would not have allowed it. You had to rely to some extent on the cooperation of the Saddam government. And it's very easy to point fingers at the UN for not having designed this, this properly. In fact, it was us 
the member states of the Security Council who designed the program. In fact, most of the original design of the Offer Food program was done in the British Foreign Ministry. It was not the UN who designed it. So we should be very clear about where that responsibility lies. I think there's a lot to be learned the next time round. This goes to your second point. In terms of scrutiny after the program was implemented, we did not scrutinize contracts for uh, financial probity, for p potential corruption, kickbacks, all the rest of it. We scrutinized them for one thing alone, that was dual-use goods, for the potential to create weapons programs of some kind. Even that was an enormous task. I remember our office being presented with documents this high just for one contract for, a, say, a, an oil refinery or a, a weapon, a uh, water. You're, you're not uh, exaggerating, literally? No. I'm literally not a few feet tall. It was a massive, massive task to scrutinize the contracts even for dual-use technologies. And we didn't employ, frankly, enough officials even to do that. Clearly, in retrospect, we should have employed, employed a whole bunch of other officials to scrutinize the financial issues uh, and the potential for corruption, which I think, looking at Volcker, was much greater than we, we had realized. Yeah. Mr. Lopez? Dr. Lopez? I, I, I sat with um, Iraqi and UN and emergency relief officials in 93 and 94 in assessing humanitarian impact. One of the things that struck me in that dialogue in 94, which continued in 95, was that even a reasonable Iraqi public official was adamantly opposed for sovereignty reasons to the UN coming in and managing the entire program. And I asked directly in, in a meeting, so we're going to have continual death of babies under five because of the impact of this that, in fact, the sanctioning agency is trying to relieve. And he said directly to me, you've partitioned my country in threes, you bomb it, Will, you have control over every economic asset we have, and now you want to publicly label your food coming in to fill our children, to feed our children. I have to draw the line there. And I think the strength of a sovereignty argument there, that's not to Excuse apologize. Me. I'm sorry to interrupt. Who said that? That is an Iraqi official. Okay. Now, I don't give the Iraqis credibility very much on the way they manage the system, but I think Karin's point about the atmosphere in which sanctions unfolded, that is, the imperative to have humanitarian relief reach Iraqis, meant that those officials that were forming the system in 94 to 96 didn't make deals with the devil, as they saw it then. They made practical political deals in which they were willing to give the Iraqis more sovereign control of resources because of the desired outcome, which to, to increase the caloric and protein intake of people on the ground, which the program's record dramatically shows was successful. The lesson, I think, whether it be Sudan or Iran, is beware of comprehensive sanctions which will immediately have humanitarian impact. Move instead to more targeted measures in which you as the sanctioning agents can control the impact and you rely less and less on local cooperation of those that are targeted. Right. W let me ask you, the, given the package of reforms that were recommended by the Secretary General uh, on Friday that were rejected and the vote wasn't close, I think it was 108 to 50 something, uh, where do we go from here in terms of trying to build a framework of, uh, I, think, I think Mr. Van Hollen described it as the coalition of the willing on, on sanctions. Is it worthwhile to spend the time within the UN to try to get the support of those, all those nations to, to try to uh, put a tight, targeted, enforceable sanction in place against a, a given country? Can, can, we, can we do that with, uh, with a framework that is, is outside the UN, uh, NATO, or, or uh, another ad hoc group, uh, given, given the circumstances? Um, I have to say I, I'm a little bit confused by this conflation of the UN reform issue with that of sanctions. Uh, it is not the UN Secretariat's responsibility to implement sanctions or to police sanctions. It is the UN member states who have that responsibility. If a Chapter 7 resolution is passed in the UN Security Council, then each state is directly legally responsible to ensure that it respects and its institutions respect whatever sanctions measure is agreed. All for food pro the All for Food program was a very exceptional thing that was given to the UN Secretariat to implement on behalf of the Se Security Council. I don't think that, sh that exercise should ever be repeated, not least because of the, the, the effects that George and I have been talking about. 
I think it's perfectly feasible to have an effective sanctions regime agreed in the Security Council if a number of conditions apply, namely that you prove that there is a threat to international peace and security, secondly that you've done the political preparation work to build support within the Security Council, and thirdly that your measures are seen appropriate and targeted on the right people and not affecting the wrong people. Right. I've, I've read your article. I, you know, very well done and, and well stated. Uh, getting consensus on on, on those, those those points may be difficult. That's that's what I'm getting at. Uh, is it is it? Uh well, I, I think I think the UN reform argument, to be to be frank, sir, is a bit of a red herring. Uh, it, it, you don't need to get an agreement on UN reform as proposed by the Secretary General or, or the U.S. government in order to get sanctions, good effective sanctions, agreed in the Security Council. If you're talking about sanctions on Iran, there's two, or, or Darfur, or whatever, those are two very separate issues. What you need to get is political consensus in the Security Council for what are seen a, a, as appropriate, well targeted, and justified measures. That's an entirely different matter. Mm. And I if suppose. I might jump off yeah. from there, uh, Mr. Lynch, the, the critical dimension here is that sanctions are a means to accomplishing a policy where sanctions have run in trouble and I think have been uh, problematic for U.S. foreign policy in the past is when sanctions, in fact, become the policy. And at least some of the discussion with regard to Iran has been quite confusing, both in U.S. policy circles and with regard to the role of the Security Council in this matter. The, the goal seems to be sanctions on Iran, as opposed to what particular outcomes we'd like from the Iranians and to ask whether or not sanctions would be an effective means. I, I would submit, as a student of sanctions, that the Iranian case is particularly problematic for resolution given the goals of denuclearizing Iran, not the least of the reasons being that you can't, in fact, get full agreement in either a technical sense or in a political sense at the Security Council. I, I direct the Committee's attention, for example, to the recent work just last week published of Matthew Bunn and the folks at the Managing the Atom Project out of Harvard, which has suggested two different scenarios for the resolution in a technical way of uranium enrichment by the Iranians. And that particular kind of evidence is the evidence that we're hearing discussed by the technical experts associated with the Council and the IAEA. In other words, it's going to be very difficult to build a consensus for sanctions no. politically when, in fact, there's technical disagreements about how close the Iranians are to developing a weapon that would constitute a threat to peace. The second dimension that the history of sanctions, I think, shows us in this case is that if sanctions imposed are going to critically isolate and punish a regime, rather than put it in a position of more direct engagement with the Council to achieve the desired ends, and they provide a nationalistic leader with a rally around the flag effect where they can, in fact, thump the Council and thump the Council members for them actually being the offenders, I mean, we saw this with Milosevic. We, we saw this with Charles Taylor. There's no reason, knowing what we know now, to reinvent the same scenario with a quite erratic Iranian leader. And while we don't have responsibility for that Iranian leader, we do have responsibility for the outcomes of a policies which will only further aggravate a situation rather than accomplish our goals. Thank you, Dr. Lopez, and thank you, uh, Mr. Lynch. Uh, Mr. Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and let me thank all of you for your your testimony. Let me just uh, begin where Dr. Lopez uh, left off at the beginning of his, his comments. And the, you're right, sanctions are a means to accomplish a policy. And if I could just begin by asking all of you the question, if you go back historically uh, and look at different times the United States or other countries have imposed economic sanctions, could you point out in which cases you think they were success stories in terms of achieving those policies, in which cases they were not success stories, and what factors made them successful or unsuccessful? I, I realize it's a broad question, but if you could uh, give it a, your best shot. If I could just uh, relate it uh, again to Iraq sanctions, uh, which is um, the focus of many of the testimonies that we've given, uh, it gets to the question of targeted sanctions as well that my colleagues have spoken. Uh, oil for food was an example of where when you do target certain things, you can be successful. We targeted the ensuring that Iraq did not have contracts with dual-use items. And in fact, the United States had about 60 people within DOD, DOE, Interior, and others who were reviewing those stacks of contracts to try to weed out dual-use items. So in, in that sense, focusing on uh, the dual-use items was a success. It kept WMD out of Iraq. Uh, the areas where we 
didn't do as well on the economic sanctions, where we um, failed to try to take those same contracts and try to evaluate whether or not the prices were inflated. We didn't have the same vigor. We didn't have the same numbers of individuals that were trying to look at the same contracts and say, well, why are we spending so much money for the import of certain type of wheat when it would be cheaper on the international market? Thank you. Mr. Ross? Um, to answer your question, Mr. Van Hollen, um, uh, I would take the example of Lockerbie, um, where sanctions were eventually successful um, for the reason uh, that they were seen as, uh, in response to a clear egregious act by a member state, uh, the measures taken, the sanctions, which were a flight ban and aviation bans and an arms embargo on the Libyan leadership, were seen as appropriate and targeted. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, the criteria that Libya had to fulfill were clearly, were clearly defined, uh, namely that they had to hand over the suspects who'd been indicted for the Lockerb Lockerbie bombing to trial. In the case of Iraq, the criteria for, for, for fulfillment of Resolution 687 were not terribly well defined. And indeed, during the sanctions period, they'd often be confused by US government statement, statements, for, for instance, by then President Clinton, that sanctions would remain on Iraq as long as Saddam Hussein remained in power. In other words, they became confused with the regime change agenda. And not only the Iraqis, but many other Security Council members would say to us, you keep moving the goalposts, what exactly does Iraq have to do to define exactly what they had to do? And this was a, a constant task for us to reiterate those criteria. So I think th those, those things made the, the Libya case a, a better example to follow. Thank you. I'd certainly concur on, on the Libyan case. I, I think uh, even respecting Congressman Shea's comment at the end of the last session that uh, Gaddafi looked around and got a little nervous after uh, the spring of 2003, uh, that nervousness was able to, we were able to translate that to real action because of almost a decade long uh, bargaining process that were generated by, by sanctions and, and the ability to combine incentives with sanctions. I think if you compare uh, the combination of UN action with EU action in, in the first go round in the terrible Yugoslav wars of the early 90s versus the EU sanctions uh, in 2000, 2001 that brought Milosevic down essentially. Uh, what, what you have is the difference between uh, punitive, uh, real scattered sanctions versus more targeted ones and the very important dynamic of providing incentives and exceptions to sanctions to those, in fact, who support international policies. So, so the combination of sanctions and incentives, I think, are critical. I don't think the committee should fail to recognize uh, how relatively successful the Security Council 1267 Committee, the 1373 process, that is, the targeted financial sanctions on terrorist groups and designated entities has been to produce success. Uh, the batting average over the course of history may be somewhere between 0.275 and 333. Uh, for those of us who are baseball fans, that'll get you a multi-million dollar contract. May not be as, as, as far along in the policy process as we'd like. We'd like 90% of sanctions cases to be effective. Uh, we know historically that arms embargoes are a sieve and they're a tragedy, but now we know something about how to improve them. But in the 90s, this was a scandalous failure. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ross, I'd just like to ask you a couple questions about your, your role. You were at the U UN uh, on behalf of the British government. And as I understand it from your testimony, you were also responsible for the liaison with the UN weapons uh, inspectors at the That's time. Correct. And I raised a lot, a number of questions uh, with Ambassador Bolton with respect to the fallout uh, yes. for the United States and others in the international community uh, from the failures in Iraq, specifically with respect to the failures of our claims about the existence of weapons of mass destruction to prove true and the implications there for our efforts uh, today and in the future with respect to making uh, claims and also the concern at the United Nations that resolutions adopted may at some point be used uh, by the United States or another country uh, as a point for unilateral military action and making yeah. that a something that makes other nations a little leery about trying to uh, take action with respect to economic sanctions. Do you have yes. any comments on that? Well, well, I agree with everything you said. Um, I think uh, U.S. arguments that Iran is a threat to international peace and security are severely undermined by the discredited, discredited evidence over Iraq. Uh, uh, that is one problem which, with which I wholly agree with your analysis. Um, secondly, on the legal justification argument, I think that's an important and yet subtle point. Um, 
the history of the UN resolutions before the war is quite a complicated one, and it's easily uh, mischaracterized. Uh, the US and UK sold Resolution 1441 to the Security Council on the basis that it was the last chance for peace. It was the last chance for inspections to, to be successful. They did not sell it as authority for the use of force. This is proven by the fact that the UK delegation later was required to go back to the Security Council with a second draft resolution, which British lawyers judged was necessary to get authority for the use of force. This was the so-called second resolution. The UK failed to get that resolution, and in negotiation they were asked explicitly, do you need this resolution to get authority for the use of force? I know this secondhand from my colleagues at the UK mission and from uh, other friends who were at the Security Council at the time. By that time, I had, I had left the UK delegation. The UK failed to get that second resolution. In other words, if you go to the Security Council and fail to get, and you ask them for the authority of the use of force, and you fail to get it, you do not have the authority for the use of force. And I think that sequence of events still sits in the minds of Security Council members, particularly the permanent five, who of course are permanent members of the Security Council and were there then as they are today. And they remember very well. Uh, Sergei Lavrov was then the Russian permanent representative in the Security Council, and there's no doubt that he feels that he was misled in that sequence of events, and that's why he says today that he has a sense of deja vu when he sees U.S. Uh, tactics in the Security Council. No, I appreciate that, because I think that our own actions uh, with respect to Iraq at the United Nations have clearly undermined our ability to go back to the Security Council to get the kind of action that we want to take with, on economic sanctions uh, with respect uh, to Iran, and it's going to hurt our ability uh, in the future in dealings with uh, Iran. Uh, you mentioned uh, in, in your testimony that at some point, and I understand the shortcomings with respect to the, the sanctions in Iraq and the, mm -hmm. the fact they weren't targeted, as you explained in your testimony, but uh, you mentioned that uh, we believe sanctions uh, had, at some point, um, your, your testimony was that they had achieved, largely achieved, Yes. Uh, success in terms of at least the goal of preventing uh, Saddam Hussein in Iraq from uh, rearming and developing weapons of mass destruction. That's and that correct. was sort of the private consensus among yes. the British and U.S. governments at the time. Could you comment further on that? Um, I'm still covered by the Official Secrets Act in Britain, which is a rather draconian piece of legislation that prevents me from talking about anything which uh, I learned during my time as a British official including my testimony to the Butler Review, uh, which is still uh, covered by that act, and that led to my resignation. Uh, but all that notwithstanding, um, it was clearly the view within the British and US governments that Iraq was not substantially rearming for all the years I worked on the subject. I took part in the regular quarterly discussions between the US State Department and the Foreign Office on Iraq, where, of course, the weapons inspections and Iraq's rearmament was the top of the agenda, and we would begin those talks by saying uh, sanctions have been successful, Iraq is not rearming, there is no threat from Iraq. The claim that Iraq was a threat, which was made by my government and the US government from mid-2002 onwards, I believe was deeply misleading. Thank you for your testimony. If I might add to that, as, as someone who after 99 was deeply involved in the linkage between sanctions and inspections, our, our own research work and almost 200 private interviews confirm this, which is why a good colleague of mine and I published in Arms Control today in September of 2002 why we thought if you were to enter Iraq you would find weapons remnants only. We saw a significant shift after we, at the State Department's request in February of 2002, uh, began work on the, on the smart sanctions resolution, we saw a significant shift in thinking at the highest levels of government, which moved from a widely accepted belief before 2001 till after about the effect of the sanctions. And I think there's more evidence to suggest, uh, rather than national defense estimates and others, that it was fairly widely known among the expert community that these had taken a biting and devastating a uh, uh, chunk out of Saddam's ability. In fact, the oil for food leakage money was used for political patronage. It was not used for production of materials, and that was well documented. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all for you. Dr. Lopez, it was also used to 
uh, influence the French and the Russians, yeah, correct? I, no, I think that's absolutely the case. Yeah. Yes. Um, there's so much that I want to ask you because I, I think there's so many elements here uh, to be discussed, and I don't want to get distracted. But I will tell you that when I went to visit with officials in Great Britain, in France, in Turkey, uh, in Jordan, uh, in Israel, uh, there was no question on the part of these government officials that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. The only debate I got into with these officials before war broke out was there were some who said he wouldn't use them. And, and um, you know, I, I believe that even President Clinton believed that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not in any way convinced that Hillary Clinton voted because George Bush felt there would be um, weapons. The arrogance of this administration, I think, stemmed from the fact, that, Mr. Ross, that they actually thought after the war we'd basically be able to stick it in front of people's faces and say, there it is, now what do you have to say for yourself? Um, I remember in 94, the challenge was, we didn't think at that time that he had a nuclear program. And when you had the uh, head of the program who had no longer been involved, claim he was part of it. Uh, the U.S. said, there is no program and we don't know who you are. It wasn't until Saddam's um, two son-in-laws went to Jordan that they located. So the, ch the, the irony is, at one point, we didn't think he had it when he had it. And another point, there were a lot of people in government who thought he had it when he didn't have it. That's the, yes. that's the irony. And, and so then when people were saying, um, you know, that he doesn't have it, I, I'll tell you my attitude was, well, you were wrong once the other way. I'm not going to let you get away with it a second time. So at um, any rate, uh, it is, uh, for me, um, I, I guess what I first want to ask is, give me some examples where comprehensive sanctions have worked and where so-called smart ones. I mean, I think there was a comprehensive sanction, weren't there, against South Africa? Weren't they fairly comprehensive? Um, well, in the case of uh, uh, South Africa, there were various financial sanctions, but comprehensive sanctions are, in the case of Iraq, mean something much more severe. Okay. I hear you. Uh, namely, a ban on all imports and exports. Food, uh, uh, Well, it was never including food or other humanitarian supplies. It's mis not accurate to claim that they covered those items. It was never supposed to cover those items. Medicine, it was never supposed to cover? No, them. no. Uh, those were always exempted, as, as it was he, called. But he didn't have money to buy? So, well, let me back up then, just to make sure mm -hmm. we were talking from the same foundation. So Saddam had food. He had medicine coming in. He just chose not to. He didn't have the means to purchase it, or he, or he just chose not to get it to where he wanted, where we wanted it to go. Um, they had to get approval for purchases on a case-by-case -case basis um, uh, for anything that they wanted to import. These things had to be approved by the 661 Committee of the Security right. Council. What this produced was a very cumbersome, bureaucratic, and slow process. Uh, and as I'm sure you realize, that, uh, a, 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 an economy that can support a decent life for its citizens and a health care system requires much more than just right. imported drugs. It requires electricity, it requires functioning sewer systems, all of these things. And those, that infrastructure declined very rapidly after uh, comprehensive sanctions were imposed in 1990. And it, the, the, the remedy didn't start to appear until the Orphan Food Program was implemented in 1996. If I may, sir, I'd just like to sure. return to your sure. point that you introduced right. your question with about WMD. I, I didn't say that Iraq had no WMD. It was, was our view within the British and US governments that Iraq had some WMD. We believe they had some remnants of the original program that they'd been developing very vigorously mm -hmm. uh, up until the uh, war of 1990. What I did say, however, was that we did not believe Iraq was a threat. And that is a very different thing. In order to be a threat, you have to have a, considerable stocks of weapons, and B, the means to deliver them. And we did not believe that Iraq had the means to deliver them. They had approximately 12 dismantled Scud, Scud missiles lying around somewhere, we thought. In fact, there turned out to be none. Right. They had no effective air force. So, so the real the issue is uh, potential uh, possession of weapons of mass destruction, just not in any great quantity in the, and, and the delivery mm -hmm. system to provide we, them. We did not, as I recall, believe that they had substantial stocks of any WMD, chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons. We believe that they had failed fully to account for their holdings and destruction of their previous stocks. 
Uh, Ambassador Bolton al alluded to that point. They had failed to give us a credible account of their destruction of previous stocks. That did not mean that we believe they had substantial stocks. We had no evidence, intelligence or otherwise, that they had substantial stocks of weapons or the means to deliver them. On that basis, our internal assessment was that Iraq was not a threat. And that was the case until I left the job in June 2002. Let me uh, just say that I agree with Mr. Van Hollen that, um, uh, that when you're wrong, I was wrong, you lose credibility. The President lost cre credibility, mm -hmm. I lost credibility, our nation lost credibility. I mean, that just seems intuitively to be something I can accept. Um, what what um, I'm hearing you say, though, is that the sanctions against, so let me ask this, and I'll ask you, Dr. Lopez, as well. Mr. Christoph, if I'm not in an area where you've done research, but if I am and I haven't asked you, feel free to jump in. Um, has there anywhere, where have, if ever, comprehensive sanctions worked? I'm struggling to give you an example. Dr. Lopez? The same. Uh, remember, the South African ones were only partly uh, ascribed to by major trading states. Only Haiti, former Republic of Yugoslavia, and Iraq are the comprehensive ones where actually everyone signs on. and and. The approach uh, uh, that we learned from that by 94 was that not only the Western states, but the Council as a whole abandoned comprehensive sanctions because the level of punishment and devastation in the economy were, wasn't worth the political compliance we were getting. So we moved to more refined measurements. Mr. Christoph, do you have any comment on this? Uh, no, I would just you know, reiterate that uh, when you do look at Iraq and the oil for food program, you can see where parts of these sanctions were effective. Comprehensively, they were not effective. Okay. But when we focused on, as the U.S. and the U.K. did, um, holding about five and a half billion dollars of oil for food contracts because of dual-use items, that contributed to keeping WMD and dual-use items out of Iraq. Yeah. The um, so comprehensive are not something that uh, you've seen succeed or advocate. Uh, I get interested in the term sanctions versus an embargo. Now, it strikes me that a, an embargo is uh, one step beyond sanctions. Is an embargo uh, where you literally just kind of ring the state and prevent people from coming in and out? I mean, in a sense, that's kind of what I thought we were doing in Iraq. Um, are there cases where you can have um, smart embargo or targeted embargoes, or is an embargo by definition a comprehensive? They're essentially, Mr. Chairman, the same thing. I okay. mean, we would often refer to sanctions on Iraq as the oil embargo, because Iraq, oil was Iraq's biggest export, and uh, we were preventing its sale by Iraq, except through UN-controlled means. So we would talk about the oil embargo right. as a kind of different way of talking about sanctions. So I think the terms are interchangeable. And in fact, if yeah. I might add, Congressman, the, the commodity-specific embargoes are the ones that, that seem to be not only most enforceable, but most comprehensive. These are the ones that I think helped uh, resolve the situation in Liberia and, and, and ones that really focused on blood diamonds in Angola and Sierra Leone, and the Council has found these to be quite effective. Okay. Let me... Um, do you believe... Um, and this is obviously opinion here, do you believe that in order to achieve our objectives in both in, in Iran and the Sudan that we will need to have uh, some, as a targeted embargo program? And I'll start with you, Dr. Lopez. I mean, I, our objective, I, I, as I, I defined I, it, yeah. would be uh, we don't want Iran to have a nuclear program. We don't want them to be able to produce weapons-grade material. In Sudan, we want, uh, we want the, the support of the, um, of basically, of the uh, Arab Muslims in Sudan. Uh, we want the fighting and the genocide of the, of the um, uh, African Muslims to stop. Right. And uh, is sanctions the way we are going to achieve it? In your judgment, Dr. Lopez? I think sanctions would be an effective way of achieving it in Sudan if this diplomatic uh, effort of the last week seems to fail. I think we've had even more biting Security Council proposals on the table before the resolution of last week, which imposed target, targeted sanctions on four individuals. There were 20 on the original list more than a year ago.
I think that can be effective because it's an outcome of failed diplomacy that's occurred prior. My own reading, since you've asked for judgment, is that much more direct engagement by U.S. policymakers with the government of Iran ought to occur before we think about bringing this dispute to the Security Council. I mean, you, uh, direct talks, one-on-one -on -one talks. Yeah, I think a U.S.-Iranian summit is called for because of the multiplicity of issues that separate us. You know, for many people, this is still about November 1979. It's not just about the development of the nuclear program. It's about frozen Iranian assets. It's about Iranian support of terrorism. It's about the future of the Shiites in that region. We have enough issues on the table with Iran that astute diplomacy held at the summit level may in fact take this off the exclusive prerogative of a president in Iran who will stand on a soapbox and continue to proclaim us as the bad guys. Yeah. The challenge is that when uh, the president authorized our uh, ambassador in Iraq to interact with the Iran Iranians, uh, other nations began to be very concerned that somehow we were going to do something uh, outside uh, their interests. I, so, I understand that, but I think those states are continuing to redefine their interests as they see a potential deadlock in the Security Council. Okay. Um, Mr. Ross, how would you respond? Uh, I more or less agree with George Lopez on both points. Um, I, on Sudan, I think that uh, targeted sanctions on the leadership of the Khartoum government and others involved in the genocide are absolutely warranted, uh, but they do need to be calibrated uh, uh, contemporaneously with uh, what's going on politically. You can't just punish without encouraging people. Uh, you can't just punish. You also have to encourage uh, a, a political solution to what's going on in Darfur. But I think they should be threatened with sanctions if and if they don't comply, and those sanctions should be imposed. I do think, however, that Western, and uh, it's not just US, but Western efforts to get sanctions agreed on Sudan have been undermined by the ability of Sudan to argue that uh, the US and others are just seeking a kind of sort of hegemonistic plan for the Middle East where they just want to invade countries and uh, and occupy And you think them. it's a viable, um, and how do you assess that? Um, I think it's completely bogus. It's a completely bogus argument, but the illegitimacy, as many see it, of the Iraq invasion has added to, their, to the strength of that argument, and that okay, argument has considerable resonance in the Middle East. How about in Iran? On Iran, I, I agree with George Lopez. I've been troubled listening to the discussion this morning that we seem to see the relationship with Iran and its nuclear program as a sort of continuum, stepping from sanctions to the inevitable option of military force if sanctions fail. Uh, there is, of course, an alternative, which is called talking to the Iranians. Uh, I think that Iran has legitimate interests in developing nuclear power. I think they have legitimate security interests. And we should start to recognize that instead of uh, just demonizing their leadership and insulting them. Uh, if you want them to cooperate, as we do, and we don't want to use military force, as they assume we don't, I don't really see much alternative to sitting down with them and working out a viable way forward where we can create a framework where their security interests are taken care of and our legitimate concern that they don't develop a nuclear weapon is also taken care of. Uh, let me just pursue this a little bit. Um, given the, the kinds of comments that are made by the President of Iran, um, you believe that uh, that is, should compel us to dialogue with them, uh, make us feel that dialogue would work out uh, in a way that would benefit our interests? Um, to just kind of give me a sense. I mean, uh, you know, no. he, 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 is, he has said extraordinarily outrageous things. I, I agree, but it's not just me. As you, as you yourself commented, Mr. Chairman, your, your own ambassador in Baghdad suggested dialogue with Iran. You have interests in common. Uh, including instability in Iraq. You need Iranian help to stabilize Iraq and indeed the broader Middle East area, if not the world. Uh, Iran has a potential to be enormously troublesome in the Middle East and globally. Uh, and I think that before pursuing what, to my mind, would be a pretty disastrous option of military force, you should consider talking to them. Okay. Let me uh, just ask one more point and then, you know, given there are just two of us here. Okay. Um, uh, what one of my staffers wrote down, and, and I agree with it, but I'm going to read it. So sanctions and reform are completely separate, question mark, question mark. A corrupt, mismanaged UN empowered and tolerated by members, states, is just likely to craft effective targeted sanctions as well as mismanaged and accountable, as well as well-managed and accountable organizations. Does the credibility of the organization imposing, this is the question, does the credibility of the organization imposing the sanctions have nothing to do with the likelihood member states and others will respect them. 
Well, there seems to be a, a lot of confusion in the question, if I may say so, without wanting to be rude. Um, no, that's uh, right. I'm, I'm, I'm claiming this statement. My staff wrote it, but I happen to buy into it. Well, I, uh, there seems to be this endless confusion between the UN as this sort of generic concept right. and the member states. Uh, the UN Secretariat is tasked to implement things by the UN Security Council, which is composed of its member states. And as I said before, the primary, primary obligation of Im implementing sanctions and policing them and ensuring that our companies don't do trade with uh, uh, embargoed regimes and all the rest of it, that is our responsibility as the governments of the member states of the UN. It is not the UN Secretariat's responsibility. However, with all of that, well, I do just, not want to... Let me just understand that. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and we can take unilateral action as member states? How does that work? No, no, not unilateral action. If UN sanctions are imposed by the Security Council, the legal responsibility falls on every national government of the UN to impose those sanctions and to police them and to make sure that their citizens and their companies don't abuse them. So what you're saying is then the UN basically has no ability to get member states to conform. Well, the, the UN is, is its member states. The Security Council uh, and indeed the 661 Committee on, on the Iraq sanctions, we would try and get member states to uh, implement the sanctions. That was our responsibility but in the Security Council. But once the Council. member states agree to abide by them and they just don't abide by them, uh, what is the alternative when we just blame the, the member well, states? Well, we found that very problematic. I mean, the, those breaches, as they were called, sanctions breaches, would come to the 661 Committee where we would try and impose, uh, we would take the, take the country's concern to task and try and encourage them to, uh, to uh, implement the sanctions. But uh, we had very little real means to persuade them and to see, do that's, otherwise. That, that's how I connect the dysfunction of the UN. It yeah. doesn't, it, you know, to say that the member states have to abide by it, but but then there's no uh, mechanism. Well, that's one kind of dysfunction, certainly. I think once, once sanctions regimes start to crumble, you've got real problems in propping them up. But that, I do think that is a separate question from the broader question of secretariat reform, which you have addressed this morning. I, I do think that's important. I'm not decrying right, no, efforts to reform. I think they are all connected. And I think certainly, if not in your minds, but in the minds of the broader public, the UN is one big thing. It's all connected. And if, if the UN has disgraced itself overall for food, I think it would be wise to reform itself to, to avoid such accusations in future. I hear you. Thank you. Well, my only problem with the question is my staff wrote it in such small type, knowing that that would <laughs> aggravate me. Uh, Mr. Lynch. Sure. Thank you. I, I, I want to follow up on that. My, my principal question was on another matter, but I do want to follow up. You know, like, like the chairman, I've, I've spent, uh, I think, just came back from my fifth trip to Iraq, been to Afghanistan as well. And I have to say that the difference between what I see on the ground in Afghanistan and what I see on the ground in Iraq is directly related to the participation of the UN. When, you, when you're on the ground in Afghanistan, the presence of the UN there, and they've got jurisdiction over the northern and western parts of the country, the presence of UN troops, mm. uh, UN vehicles, uh, definitely induces the imprimatur of a humanitarian effort there in Afghanistan, and mm -hmm. the people respond to that. Now, there, there are problems in Afghanistan, but clearly uh, the situation in Afghanistan, even though they're desperately poor, only 6 percent of the people have electricity, Iraq much, much further ahead uh, economically and development-wise, there's still great value in, in having the UN take the lead on that. And I appreciate that it is the responsibility of each constituent government to, to uh, force compliance with, with sanctions. But that, that collective effort is, is, is much, much greater than the individual components. And, I, and I, 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 I do have to say that a lot of my constituents would say, if that's not what the UN is for, what the hell is it for? Yeah. And, yeah. and, and that's exactly why we pay our dues to the UN, because we, we, want, that, we want that collective strength yeah. as, as a community of nations. It legitimizes uh, actions that, that might otherwise be suspect. And, and I dare say that, at least in the case of Afghanistan, the fact that the UN is supporting the effort there and, and the British are handling the poppy eradication. The Germans are training the uh, Afghani police department. Uh, the Canadians, the French, they're doing their part in, in, in individual government roles, but all as part of that larger program. 
it has contributed mightily to the success there and the progress there yes. that it is under the umbrella of the UN and, and as well un under NATO as well. So I just, um, I know it's a distinction you're making, but, but, uh, but I still see tremendous value in having the UN as, as being the lead. Now, Mr. Lynch, could I even support sure, that? Please, um, I'm sorry. Just having come back from Iraq as well and spending some time with the international community in Amman, Jordan, I think there is a growing desire on the part of the specialized agencies, the IMF and the World Bank, to become more engaged in Iraq because what they bring are the kinds of specialized skills that the UN has traditionally brought. FAO with its agricultural skills, WHO with its health specialists, et cetera, UNDP with its development specialists. So there is a desire, I think, on the part from what I heard when I was in Amman, of the international community to try to re-engage uh, with um, our efforts at reconstruction within Iraq. And you do see the, the contrast with NATO and other specialized agencies within Afghanistan. Well, I also completely agree with the point you made, Mr. Lynch. I, I set up the International Security Assistance Force in uh, Afghanistan after the invasion uh, by a Security Council resolution which I negotiated on the Security Council. And there's no doubt that uh, the fact that it is seen as a multinational effort in Afghanistan contributes to the credibility of that effort and thus to stability in Afghanistan. Mr. Lopez, Dr. Lopez. Well, I, it, it, for all the difficulties we had in acquiring Security Council mandate before going into Iraq, maybe the equal tragedy is, is the decision by the United States to ask the Council for our singular designation as a belligerent occupier after the war when we had the opportunity, in fact, to re-engage the international community substantially. And, and, and that's as sad a moment in the Security Council for me as, as early March 2003, when, when, when later on we were in December of 2003 in a position which we could have gone back to the Council and said, okay, now it's time to internationalize the effort, uh, let bygones be bygones, and we systematically rejected that option. That was a sad moment. I'll yield back. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman just yielding to me a second. I, this is, um, hearings do show my ignorance of certain issues, but I sure learn a lot in the process by exposing my ignorance. The implication is that had we not asked for this um, uh, designation, uh, your implication is that we could have asked what? We had an opportunity to ask the Security Council to bless after the fact the occupation of Iraq by U.S. forces, but to multinationalize that force and particularly to multinationalize the reconstruction program. And my understanding of the way the events unfolded was that we asked for the belligerent occupier designation, which means that future elections and economic reconstruction would fall under the purview of the United States. Okay. The elections, though, were supervised by the Commission. That was one of the extraordinary events. Excuse me, I don't need to claim the time. I'll come back. Thank you. I just wanted that. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. Really. Thank you. Appreciate and, and, I, and I appreciate it, Dr. Lopez. My question is this. Now, I, I, for example, uh, by hypothetical, I, I want to refer, Mr. Ross, to, you, to your, your piece in the Washington Post where you posit the rhetorical question, uh, could sanctions be used effectively, I'm paraphrasing, could, be, could sanctions be effectively used against Iran? Mm -hmm. and, and you go on to say that uh, and again, I'm, I'm paraphrasing that largely because of conditions precedent and, and which exist there now and within the current framework, it, it, it is unlikely to work. Let's assume, though, for the purpose of my question, that the conditions precedent have been met, that, that there is consensus mm -hmm. among uh, the wider community that there is the urgency. I think you used the example if, if Iran were testing uh, mm -hmm. nuclear weapons and mm -hmm. that there was a sense of urgency there and that there was a consensus th among uh, the UN that, that we needed to act. Assuming those things, what would, what would sanctions, effective sanctions in your mind look like? What are the terms of those sanctions against Iran that might be effective? Because that may be the, the situation down the road that we're, we're confronted with. The terms of the sanctions, I think, would be pretty clear that you would want Iran to comply with its obligations under the, the Non-Proliferation Treaty to allow access for the full access for the International Atomic Energy a Agency, et cetera, et cetera. Those would be the criteria that you would seek to, to demand. 
uh, at the sorts of means that you might introduce to the Security Council to achieve those demands would be things like targeted sanctions on the leadership of Iran, namely things like asset freezes, uh, other financial sanctions, travel bans. I think an arms embargo is also a clear option for the Security Council since this would be an issue of international peace and security. Okay. Those are the essential elements? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Christoph? Uh, the only comment I would have is uh, about uh, targeted financial san sanctions. I know that the UN and the international community is moving more towards targeted sanctions rather than comprehensive sanctions. Uh, when I uh, talk with OFAC officials and Treasury officials about just trying to get countries to return assets of the former regime, one of the challenges that they always faced in trying to put targeted sanctions on individuals is that when the sanction is announced and when it's eventually enforced can be a long time lag that would allow the individual to move those assets quickly. So, I clearly believe that targeted sanctions are important, but the practicality sometimes of enforcing them uh, can be difficult. Right. Dr. Lopez? I, I agree with everything that's been said by my two colleagues. I think the real two challenges in the Iranian case would be, do, do you want to, on the back of a strict arms embargo, really expand what you consider dual-use goods that could reinforce military, military goods already existing mm -hmm. and expand things like Wassenaar lists and others to, to a large number of items? Uh, the second issue, and, and the greatest temptation, I think, is because Iran is, is, is heavily dependent on a precious and, and large-scale export, the, the prospect for oil embargoes, I think, looms in the mind of many, uh, although we know what both the humanitarian aspect of that would be and, and the effect on Western markets itself and Western consumer economies would be substantial. You know, one of the histories of uh, em embargo success is that the imposers are willing to accept substantial costs. And, and the suggestion of uh, embargoing Iranian oil would pose that question in new and significant ways in 2006 to the U.S. economy in particular that it's not been posed before. Right. And, and, and you know, I'm sort of cheating a little bit because uh, one, of the, one of the factors that Mr. Ross has pointed out to is uh, one of the factors that's very important is, is the cooperation of neighboring States. So, yeah. given the geopolitical situation there, uh, and the fact that we don't have uh, a financial intelligence unit in Amman and in a number of other major uh, financial centers around that area, would also uh, present problems in terms of isolating uh, that that regime. I think it can be done with a will, um, as long as you have the political consensus and you're prepared to give it sufficient technical attention. I mean, during the Iraq sanctions years, despite all the political rhetoric that our leaders uh, paid to uh, Iraq, we never set up a financial sanctions unit on Iraq. Uh, I had frequent discussions with U.S. Treasury officials saying, should we not set up such a unit to target Saddam's illegal financial holdings, which were many sitting in Swiss bank accounts, etc., etc. He agreed. He felt that we could do it. Such a unit would, we, f we felt, be effective. Uh, I personally recommended it at several sessions uh, of talks between the British and American governments. It was never implemented. Mm -hmm. It, okay. It's really Security Council Resolution 1483 in May of 2003, after American forces have toppled the regime, that actually imposes the asset freeze on Saddam Hussein's family and designated officials because we were fearful of them fleeing the country and being able to get to assets. It's right. one of the ironies of the, Irani of the Iraqi well, case. I hate to correct you, George. There was, of course, an assets freeze before that. I mean, comprehensive sanctions included all, asset, asset all financial assets of the Iraqi regime. So from 1990 onwards, no government was allowed to hold financial assets for the Iraqi regime. Uh, but we never put any effort, nor did the UN collectively put any effort into enforcing that part of the comprehensive embargo. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. I yield back. I feel like we. Both of us have this golden opportunity to talk to the three of you, and I'd like to just go on a little bit longer here. Um, I, I want to first know from um, all three of you, maybe I'm getting you out of your territory, uh, Mr. Christoph, and areas you can't respond, so don't feel like you need to. Um, do you believe that, uh, just taking Iran first, it is uh, a, a, an absolute imperative that we prevent Iran uh, or not that we prevent, that somehow Iran does not move forward uh, with its uh, nuclear program and the obvious fear that we have that they will develop a weapons-grade material. 
One, do you think that's where they're headed? And two, do you think it's in the world's interest to prevent that? And I'll start with you, Mr. Ross. And, and, and I'm just trying to understand, you'll understand why I'm asking these questions. Sure. Yeah. Um, we don't yet know that that's where Iran is headed. Um, there is no uh, conclusive proof of that. Um, the latest IEA report suggests that um, they have achieved a certain level of uh, uranium, uranium enrichment. In, indeed, they've publicly avowed this themselves. And worryingly, they've also denied the IEA full access to their sites and to information about their program. Uh, this is concerning. Um, and it does perhaps suggest that they have less uh, altruistic uh, 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 goals in mind than the mere development of a civil nuclear yeah, program. Let, yeah, let me just pursue that but the point, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, Russia in particular and Europe seem surprised that this program was progressing as quickly as it had and that they had had this program for 18 years contrary to uh, what they had claimed, um, correct? Russia is surprised at that, did you say? Yes, Russia I, was. I'm, I don't know, I'm afraid. Okay. Because, you know, the information we get is that, that one of the reasons we have some opportunity to deal with the Russians is that they feel that Iran has not been forthcoming to them. But that's not information that well, you... Well, it's clear that Iran has not been forthcoming to anybody. Um, right. um, they're not being forthcoming to the IEA. They need to be forthcoming to the but, IEA. But it had, for a number of years, had this program in development. I mean, this yeah. isn't... So um, that, that certainly leads one to begin to question where they're headed if they had done this uh, uh, at the same time they claimed they never were. I mean, yes. Their credibility clearly is, is, is pretty low. I agree with that. Okay. Their credibility would, would be wonderfully increased if they were to allow the IEA full access. Right. Dr. Lopez? Yeah, I think this speaks to the question of what's the immediate goal. And I think IAEA access is the goal. And continued dialogue with Iranians about the pace of the development of their civilian program and the distinction between a civilian energy program and a weapons producing program is, is critical. And, and, and what shifted, I think, in the diplomatic dialogue, and particularly in U.S. foreign policy dialogue over the last three months, has been a leapfrogging over those important first steps to the notion that it's important for us to deny Iran a weapon. Uh, senators that I have a great deal of respect for have said there's two dangerous things that loom before us, a U.S. attack on Iranian facilities and Iranian development of a weapon, as if those were the only two choices. Okay. And I think the issues that lie before us are that we have a country that's now continuing to back away from international inspections to which it had been a part up to now, even while it did, on occasion, falsify information and withhold information aren't from those you being, inspections. Aren't you being really generous when you say on occasion? I, I'm don't being they, generous, sir, because the stakes are too high. No, no, no. The, the, you don't want to be generous. You want to be accurate. Yes. Uh, okay. And, and with all due respect, I, I, I was kind of saying, you know, I'm agreeing with these folks in front of me, and now I'm beginning to think, uh, and I admit you lose your credibility when you say Saddam has a weapons program and he doesn't, so uh, I'm going to have to live with that. But I feel like we're being a bit naive uh, in, in, in an extraordinarily generous to Iraq to suggest that 18 years of developing a program to which the world was not aware of uh, and now is aware of um, uh, that we can't draw certain conclusions. The trend line is in, the, in, in clearly the wrong direction. I mean, am I wrong about that? No, I think the trend line is in the direction you pointed. But we need to cut it by three, I think, important facts. One, the technical capacity, as far as we can estimate from, from all intelligence sources, is still relatively low for the production of a real weapon. Uh, I go back to what Karin said before, which I think is critical in terms of the, the balance between Iraq and, and Iran, is I'm worried much more about the delivery capability of the Iranians. That is, they have systems that can deliver weapons rather than where they really are with the development of weapons of mass see, destruction. I, the last thing I care about, the last thing, I care less about the delivery because um, I believe that a weapons-grade material uh, in the hands of, of uh, you know, there, I don't look for a signature item coming to the United States or wherever. I, I look for it in a different direction. But Dr. Ross, uh, Mr. Ross, uh, the Iranians have no credibility as it relates to this issue, clearly, correct? I mean, 18 years of a program that they were doing undercover, now being exposed, they're saying they're moving straight ahead. The trend line is clearly in the wrong direction, whether 
so uh, if, I'm just asking the next question, which is, um, we don't want them to develop weapons-grade material, clearly. No. Now, uh, to what extent uh, would you be suggesting uh, it would be nice that they didn't do it, uh, we need to work hard that they don't do it, or it's absolutely imperative they don't do it? I, mean, what, what, I think it's extremely concerning that Iran may be developing a nuclear weapon, uh, yeah. particularly with the current regime. I think that the, the concern about it is entirely legitimate, and they have very little credibility in the, in the uh, disclosures that they've made. But um, you then need to ask yourself, if you assume that they may be developing a nuclear weapon, what are you going to do about it? You have to look at why they may be developing a nuclear weapon. They are, are now adjacent to a country uh, which is you know, still largely controlled by the world superpower, which itself is armed with nuclear weapons. Um, Israel is armed with nuclear weapons. More and more countries in their neighborhood, India, Pakistan, are armed with nuclear weapons. They may have serious security concerns of their own, particularly when confronted by a US government that seems bent on regime change and is, is fairly uh, uh, abusive in the way it describes the Iranian regime, calling them part of the axis of evil or whatever. In my view, whatever we feel about the Iranian regime, they do have legitimate security concerns uh, that they should not be attacked. This may be why they're developing a nuclear weapon. If that is the case, you need to sit down with them and work out ways of satisfying those security concerns without them developing a nuclear weapon. Do you believe that, that Iran um, has used Hezbollah as its surrogate, that they train and finance Hezbollah? Uh, I worked on the Middle East peace process, as it was then known, in happier days um, in the mid-1990s, and Iran you was You look so young to me that I, I'm trying to imagine... Uh, uh, no, I'm okay. antique. Um, uh, the Iran How certainly many years was were you in the Foreign Service? Fifteen. Okay. Uh, Iran was working, uh, was certainly supporting Palestinian Islamic Jihad and Hezbollah uh, uh, at that time. I have to say, though, at that time, um, the British government, uh, of which I was then a part, did not regard Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. They regarded them as a resist resistance organization because Hezbollah, at that time, was primarily directed at ending Israeli occupation of southern Lebanon. Uh, that has since changed, and Hezbollah has not fully uh, recognized Israel's right to exist and is still supporting some questionable activities. You're being, I don't, a, I don't you're, myself. Being, you're being a little generous here. I, I wish that well, you would be a little more forthcoming in terms of... Well, I don't, the, the truth is, so I don't know about what Hezbollah is doing today or whether Iran is supporting it today. I worked on that specific issue in the mid-1990s, so my information is somewhat out of date. So, but, but the bottom line to this whole dialogue is uh, what I think if I'm taking from this conversation is that you believe uh, direct talks need to take place with both governments, mm -hmm. Sudan and Iran, uh, before there's dialogue of sanctions and that you believe that sanctions need to be targeted, uh, such as with Iran, what would be effective? I'll tell you two that I think would be, and maybe you could tell me more. Not allowing their scientists to study abroad, their scholars not allowing their airline to land anybody where but Syria. I mm. mean, things like that. I mean, what other types of, of ways? Well, I, I mentioned in answer to Mr. Lynch's question that, that financial sanctions, uh, travel bans, uh, an arms embargo are things that you could consider for Iran. In terms of, yes, we are... Let me just quickly say, though, yes. would they be successful giving China, Russia, and some European nations well, nuts? in order to be successful, as, as I think all three of us have made clear, you need to have broad political support for them. And I think before you will get broad political support for any sanctions, you need to show that you've exhausted all other means of addressing this problem with Iran. And I think that would include dialogue. Ramping things up at this rather accelerated rate that the US is doing, pushing things through the Security Council in a very determined and aggressive and time-limited fashion is not the way to win political support. I think the US, my recommendation should be that the US should take things a little bit slower and show that it's willing to address these issues by dialogue before advancing to more punitive measures. Do you believe that um, in order for diplomacy to work that you need to uh, have uh, the concern that, uh, that you might use a military or do you think you just take military option off the table? Uh, I don't necessarily think that, um, uh, although I... Think what? I, I gave I, too much... I don't think that you should take mili the military option off the table, although I'm appalled by military action okay. in all cases. I think that in some cases it n remains a necessary thing uh, to, to have in your armory. Okay. 
Dr. Lopez, could you respond to that question? Yeah, I think that targeted sanctions in this case can be very effective, but I, I, I'm, I'm recalling the Yugoslav case where in the second generation of sanctions, we decided that we were dealing on the top with a regime we wanted changed, but at mid-levels and levels below were people who were reformers who we were trying to help. And so that as targeted as travel bans can sound and be, we even wanted to be more targeted within the imposition of that specific sanction. Because in fact, there were people we wanted to have assets. We were people we wanted to be able to travel. There were people we wanted to deal with because they were in fact opposed to the Milosevic regime. And I think there will be a real challenge in, in the case of forging Iranian sanctions to decide what will be the designated group of entities and individuals who will be subject to the targeted sanctions. It's not impossible. It's in fact very possible. But it will, it will be able to strip from the Iranian leadership that kind of rally round the flag effect which says, see, I told you they're all against us. Look at what we're all suffering. If in fact all of them are not suffering from that, that's to our advantage. I think the second issue, supporting again Karin's great statement about, about diplomacy, is uh, we have to decide, I think at the council level and, and in the, the larger powers, just how serious are we going to take sanctions? You know, at one level in, in, in the late 1980s, people kept saying to us, see, sanctions on South Africa are ineffective. By 1993, people said, wow, look at that sanctions case on South Africa. We were continually told throughout the 90s, you know, Saddam's robust uh, actions, his hostility to the West, his hostility to inspectors, sanctions aren't working. Uh, by 2003, at the end of 2003, we learned that, in fact, the sanctions had worked. But we chose dip diplomatic and uh, military means uh, to, to, to go about it a different way. I think See, we've got to broaden our thinking about sanctions. I and mean, one of the things I, I noticed in the Iraqi sanction situation was every time things were interdicted at the border, rather than being interpreted by political figures that sanctions were working because we were catching these bad things, it was interpreted in one direction only. Look how terrible this is. There must be thousands of things getting through because look what we caught this time and we only caught one. Every time inspectors found prohibited weapons and destroyed a chemical or a biological facility, we believe there was even more hiding under Saddam's bed, yeah. rather than the position and, that we were taking was actually, actually working. Well, so I think if we're going to head with Iranian sanctions, we've got to go ahead with a degree of confidence and with an ability to give it a timeline where it might actually change policy. Okay, let me say, we're going to conclude here. I, 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 um, I'm struck with a bias that I still hold, and that is, you know, when we have people from Europe lecture us about diplomacy and multilateralism, and they say, you know, Germany and France, we can talk with each other. To me, that's like Connecticut and, and New York talking with each other. I, I view it as an economic union. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, am, I am left with this feeling that um, Sanctions, uh, I, 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 in one level, Mr. Ross, I agree that there needs to be dialogue, significant dialogue, and extended. I think I have learned to have a little more faith in the recognition that with Gaddafi, it was a long-term effort. So I think what I'm hearing uh, from here is that sanctions take a while. I just don't have any faith that um, Europe's heart or Russia's heart or China's heart is in having sanctions, I think it's a, with Iran, I think it's a message to Iran, they ain't going to happen, so they don't need to fear them. And then what I fear is that the only thing left on the table uh, is military op option, which I don't uh, like at all. And, I th and I'm left with the feeling that if Europe doesn't want there to be a military option, they've got to, to uh, recognize that, that the, 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 this dialogue about sanctions have to be real and we have to we have to recognize without sanctions, you leave very little on the table. That's kind of what I'm left with. Uh, let me uh, end by saying, is there a question we should have asked that we didn't? Is there a question that you wouldn't have wanted to have responded to that, that you think we need to put on the table? Start with you, Mr. Kristoff. Uh, Mr. Chairman, a couple points. Um, why we need negotiations with Iran, not just on the nuclear issue, but we need Iran to try to help us deal with the situation in Iraq. I think as when my boss testified last week before you and we talked about the security situation in Iraq, clearly the Iranian influence in the southern part of Iraq, the arming of militias, all with Iranian influence is an important reason why we need to continue types of negotiations with Iran. Second point is that I don't want to completely divorce UN reform 
with sanctions, which w is in many respects uh, a topic of interest. I think if you want to have effective sanctions in the future, you have to engage in certain reforms. We have to have reform of the oversight services within with the United Nations. We have to strengthen the internal auditors. We have to revamp procurement. If you have an oil for food program like situation in the future, you're going to have to have a UN that has those types of strength and controls. Um, I don't disagree with the thrust of what you said, Mr. Chairman. I think my difference with you would be over the timing. Uh, at present, you're, you're right, the international consensus does not exist to impose sanctions on Iran uh, because, uh, above all, there is no compelling evidence that they're developing a nuclear weapon. But that may change. Uh, and I, what I would urge is a more patient approach to this uh, continuum of dialogue, uh, 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 sanctions, and then armed force. What I'm worried about is that the U.S. administration is currently rushing us through that line and saying, oh, look, the Europeans and the Chinese won't support uh, sanctions, therefore we have no alternative but to go to military force. I, I think this is hasty and unwise, not least because I think military force would be pretty disastrous all round, not just for the Iranians but also for us. Uh, so I would therefore urge that uh, in order to build that political consensus that other options be tried first uh, and then a more patient effort is made to build up the, the body of evidence and the record of Ara Iranian non-compliance with the Security Council's demands, then at the end of that you would have, I think, the consensus you need. Thank you. Thank you. I completely concur with that. I would underscore some of the great points you and others in the committee made about Sudan. I think we're at a critical moment with regard to Sudanese sanctions and the ability to send a clear message to the government in Khartoum that the international community now means business. Enough is enough. And, and there are ways in which an earlier uh, discussion of sanctions in Sudan, we let the Khartoum government waive the new peace treaty before us and say, well, we don't know if we'll be able to actually follow through if we're so constrained by sanctions and the international community backed away. Now I think that process has got a, 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 a dynamic of its own. It's separate from the conflict in West Darfur. It's separate from the humanitarian crisis. And I think the international community has got to get some backbone and, and, and move ahead with even more sanctions in the Sudan area. No, I, I think these people have suffered enough. <laughs> well, let me just say, Mr. Mr. Christoph, Mr. Ross, and Dr. Lopez, you've been a wonderful panel, and uh, I thank you for your taking your time with us uh, this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's You're an welcome. honor, Mr. Thank Chair. you. My pleasure. Right. Again? Good. That was good stuff. Well, nice to be with you. You too, George. I, when, I'll give you a call. I'll come to New York. Love you.